Um, whoever's running the camera, I apologize to you right now, okay? I walk around a lot like this. So you're gonna get this work, and you're gonna earn your money today. If you ever seen my B-Sides video, the guy is like, shit. <laughs> so, Phoenix's historical tours of IDS evasions and insertions and other such oddities. Oh God, a dude talking about IDS, what do we need that for? Well, we'll explain that in a second. So, who am I? Well, I'm Aaron. Some of you might know me as Phoenix. Few of you might know me for ranting quite a lot. True story. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter and mute me, you totally can. Um, I'm Scottish, which means that I swear a lot, okay? Uh, everyone raise your hands a second. Come on, I'll name and shame people. You two haven't got your hands up, come on. Come on. How many of you know a Scot? Keep your hands up if you know a Scot. Are you always impressed how much they swear? Because I fucking am. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about network intrusion prevention systems, detection systems, UTM, whatever three-letter abbreviation you want to call it today, OK? You know this dead technology. There will be people who haven't come, come to this talk because, hey, it's about IDS, and pff, that sucks, right? We all do that, and that's a fair criticism. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. What I'm not going to talk to you about, because that's not really where I'm at, is I'm not going to talk to you about user fails and so on and so forth. I'm going to be this side. Has that, have you guys seen this picture before? On one side is IDS, AV, blah, 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 blah. And on the other side is Dave. <laughs> that's your security appliance, right? You see that side, that's your budget. So, let's do the protocol stuff. Protolol, they've been kind of taking the piss out of IDS since 96. We're going to talk a little bit about P. Tak and Newsham in a kind of an interesting paper that led on to a lot of research, which really shows how sucky IDS has been and why we're always going to be on the back foot, okay? I know some of you are sitting there thinking right now that I'm a special kind of idiot because, hey, he's come to a hacking conference, he's talking about IDS, we know it sucks. Fair enough. So, when we talk about IDSs, it's really important to understand the limitations. Like, I'm, I'm gonna let you into a secret, fuck the vendors, okay? Let's just talk about it amongst ourselves, we can work this out. So, you know this dead technology, you know, in 2010, Gartner seems to think that the standalone IPS industry is $989 million, okay, just shy of a billion dollars. Why am I picking on 2010? Beginning of the Eurozone crisis. We bail out two European countries in that time. I know that you're Switzerland, you're not Europe, but we're neighbors, so you'll, you'll forgive me for this one, right? Dead technology, remember? Cisco this year, last year, sorry, purchased Sourcefire, $2.7 billion. It's not exactly chump change, is it? I was, uh, I was in a talk in Michigan, Grand Rapids, and the news just broke about Cisco. And I've got a, maybe a little bit of history of trolling Cisco over the years. And uh, so I'm doing my talk, and I'm saying, oh, Cisco's just brought Sourcefire for $2.7 billion. At $2.6 billion. Guy gets up in the middle of my talk and stops my talk and says, you're wrong. I'm like, really? Yeah. Lifts his shirt up. It's got source fire written across the top of it. I think you'll find it's $2.7 billion. I'm like, right, everyone, that's got a source fire or Cisco product. You see this guy standing up right here? He's in the sponsors area. If you've got any problems with false positives or it's not working correctly, Go and see this guy here. Give a wave to everyone. The checkpoint guys at the back of the room were like, woohoo, <laughs> fucking love you. <laughs> so you're next. <laughs> Shit. So, but you have to look at the issues that IDS itself has an issue with, okay? So we look back in the day and people, you know, people are always surprised to find out that actually IDS is older than antivirus. So when people say to you, shh, are you not worried that the IDS industry will become like the antivirus industry? 
Not really. I'm a bit more worried that the antivirus industry will become like the, the IPS industry. We spent six, seven, eight years researching this shit. So they start off back in the day with the old static string analysis, right? Woo we're going to look for bad strings. And this is the problem when you get engineers trying to fix problems, because they come up with an engineering solution. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the data stream from the bad guy, and in there, that's going to tell us what the bad guy is doing, right? Makes perfect sense. Well. When you understand that protocols themselves are very easy to talk about in some ways, but they're very hard to implement. You know, There's an old adage which I'll talk about later on, but implementers, people who implement RFCs, they have this adage that is, send conservatively, receive liberally. And what that means is, be very, very defined in what you send out we be very, very liberal in what you send in. Because we all want our protocols to work, right? We want networks, interconnected networks. That's what we want. Give us that good stuff. The problem is, is when you're looking for things that go wrong, when you don't know how the end point is going to react, this is when you start to let things slip through the cracks. Ding, 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 96, OK? HTTP of agents come about. The paper was called The Final Nail in the Coffin, right? Did I tell you that this was 96, right? 2010, spent a billion dollars on standalone IPS. Yeah, that nail in the coffin really did well, didn't it? So when you look at protocols, protocols are an interesting thing because they should be able to tell you what's happening in that data stream. That's what they should be able to do. So an IDS should be able to look at a data stream and know what's about to happen, right? Makes perfect sense. So let's talk about compression. Compression is an interesting issue because there's some things that an IDS can do and there's some things an IDS can't do. In the case of compression and HTTP chunked is an interesting issue. So we send compressed data over the internet. We send gzips and deflate and all of this good stuff. And uh, in the headers, it tells you exactly how big the gzip payload's going to be. And the IDS can go, right, I'm going to buffer this amount of space, and then I'm going to look inside, and I'm going to see the bad things, yeah? Yeah. Then rolls in HTTP chunked. As a protocol, it doesn't require you to define the length of the compressed format. It just sends you chunked data. So an IPS or an IDS has really one, one solution. Or, well, actually, it has one solution and one fail. The solution is we buffer everything. We buffer all of this chunk data, and when we stop getting received chunk data, we'll analyze it. Right? That makes perfect sense, yeah? Problem is, if I know that, I'm just going to send you chunk data until your system falls over. Because you know what? Storage is a finite. You know, we don't have infinite storage. So I'm just going to send you and send you and send you and send you crap until eventually you fall over. Or what do you think the other solution is? Basically, in our context, they go, nah, that's it. You know, we're not going to inspect this stuff because this could be too much of it. Or we're, going to only, we're only going to reserve a megabyte or two megs or whatever. Why don't we turn off HTTP chunked? Why don't we do that? Like as network defenders, we're just not going to let chunked into our network. Fuck it. RIP YouTube. You know what I mean? You're going to lose stream services very, very, very quickly. Wow, your users are going to fucking love you that day, aren't they? So, hey, I can't get to Facebook. I can't watch that cat on Facebook doing that funny thing. Oh, yeah, but you're working. But still, I'm HR. And then what we see, so we see in this that protocols themselves lend problems that are very hard to solve. Now let's interject, send conservatively, receive liberally. One of my favorite, favorite evasions, this is so simple, which is why I love it, very, love it a lot. So if you imagine this static string that we write rules for, like, hey, like a get request, and we kind of like get HTTP, you know, 
evilwebsite.com forward slash evilpayload.html dot whatever the HTTP version is, so 1.1, whatever. <laughs> it was discovered that if you changed, you know the, the HTTP 1.1 bit? See if you change that to a comma, send, send conservatively, receive liberally. What do we think the web server did? It accepted the request because meh, you obviously meant a dot. What did you think happened to static string analysis? Like, hey, we don't have a match for that. Off you go. This is, this is the beginning. This is when we start looking at this stuff and going, huh? Really? And there's a whole list of issues along the way that happen with this. Um, invalid HTTP versions is a brilliant one. So HTTP goes up to 1.1. So you can send 1.8, bypass static string analysis. And what does the server do? It goes, we don't fucking support 1.8. I tell you what, you probably mean 1.1. Here's the resource. Wah, wah, wah. Straight past static string analysis. All of this stuff played out and out and out again. This is the beginning. You know, you've got to love the IPS industry. It fucks up, and what does it do? It produces a new product and goes to market with it. We call this protocol normalization. We'll talk about that in a little minute as well. But protocols are complex. You know, directory self-referencing worked against IDSs. All of this shit is commonplace. But the problem is, is that we have all of these problems here. And then what we have is that RFCs are written by people. Remember this. And sometimes they're not very good at defining what they say and what they want to say. So we end up having protocols that aren't clearly defined. If you go through an RFC, OK, and you see an area that's not clearly defined to the implementer, OK, pound to a penny, there's a network invasion technique in there somewhere. Because once you leave the implementer to make their own mind up, guess what? They all fucking do it differently. And when we talk about implementers, we're talking about Microsoft. We're talking about Unix. You know, this TCP IP stack is an implementer who had gray areas in the RFC, and went, ah, oh, fuck it. And they made lots of different interesting, th there's differences between the stacks. They're not, they're not the same. You can't move an IP stack from Windows and have it behave the same way. They behave inherently differently. They have different, like, MOs, basically. Which is interesting, because once you have these gray areas, like, you can overwrite segments in TCP. OK, so you have protocols on top of protocols in TCP, IP. So you overwrite. You might want to change your data stream mid-transit. Once you send some packets, you might go, oh, fuck, something's changed. And I need to update that. And of course, the protocol, it's a robust protocol, allows you to do that. And we call this an overlapping segment. OK, so we can rewrite old data and new data. The RFC did not quite clearly define, in black and white, which takes precedence. If you've got some old data or some new data, which is the most important data? Pound to a penny, you know exactly what happened. They wrote different interpretations of it. Which led to the situation where if you had a Windows system and you sent overlapping fragments, favored old over new, Windows will always favor uh, old data over new data. So you, in the middle, we have this IPS that's trying to work out what the shit's going on, and it doesn't know if it's a Windows system that's being talked to or not. You know, this is you know, early days, so they haven't worked that shit quite out yet. So what we can do then is we can start to camouflage our packets, because we know, as an attacker, we know we're speaking to our Apache server on a Linux system. We, we know that, that, that fucking system. We know that, the IPS doesn't. So then we can start to, to hide messages because we know the IPS will restructure things in a certain way, okay? Because it's not clearly defined. So straight away, we've already got two issues before we've even kicked off, before we've even looked at other interesting issues on top of this. We call this protocol ambiguity. I like my protocols ambiguous, right? So, 
This is not just the case with this as well. Which, which flag takes precedence is not clearly defined. So, in an IP header with an overlapping, frag, uh, overlapping segment in TCP, you can set some freaky headers that, given certain conditions, should be dropped. The IPS doesn't check those. All of a sudden, you can start to make the IPS see one thing. It's like the rope a dope. You know, you drop your shoulder and hit them with the left, right? This is exactly what's happening here. The, the, there is, if you guys are interested in this stuff, or if you ever need to, like, if you're insomniacs and you need to get some sleep, give me an email. I've got books on this shit that could fucking bore you to death. This is why there's not much of my soul left. But this is all based on send conservatively, receive liberally. Okay, this is a big issue. Now, of course, the users want this. But as defenders, this is the last thing you want. You want predictability because we're doing a science-based discipline. Right? It's not supposed to be black magic and voodoo. Right? We're supposed to, it's a protocol. We're supposed to know what's going to happen. But the IPS doesn't have that option. It doesn't get that. Then, let's talk about flag frags and fragmentation attacks. Oh, my god. So this starts kicking out about 2,000. This bears root. Uh, the, so to give you some historical context, just to jump back for a second. Um, how many of you like use Nikto? Direct result of PTAC Nation's research, LibWhisker. So all of this stuff, all of these HTTP evasion techniques, you can test right now with, with tools that you're already using. It's just like, throws, hit, man, Nikto. Go, oh, fuck, I didn't know I did that. Trust me, it's all good. So the beloved Steve Lord of 44Con once tweeted me and said, the night is cold, they want their frag, flag, and fragmentations back. That response to him was, fuck off, I'm still using them. And the problem is, is this is absolutely true. Okay? Source port tricks screw IDSs up all the time and have done for like a decade. We still haven't fixed it. People say to me, why are you still talking about IDSs? Well, I'm going to keep on talking about it until they fucking fix it. Six years I've been talking about this shit, and nothing's changed. You know, I just find old shit is new again. Do you know what I mean? And it happens all the time. On a segue of this, we think, you know, remember we had that ping of death in IPv4. And what happens is, is you get an implementer. They, they reintroduced this issue into IPv6. Right? We fixed the problem. Woohoo! IPv6, oh shit, I can fucking dot it with a pin. Fucking hell, the night is cold. It's much the same case here. That we, we make an issue because the, pro, the, the RFC allows us to implement things with our own interpretation. We make a mistake. We don't actually fix it. All we do is patch it. So when they come to implement GCP IP or IP or ICMP on a new stack, and we haven't clearly defined in the protocol, guess what? We don't learn from our history. <laughs> we just don't, it just doesn't happen. This is what happens. Oh, fuck, it's working now. There's no test cases. Yeah, your fucking system's down next. <laughs> but this happens all the time. And trust me, the minute you start looking about at this, you'll be surprised about how much happens. But this old versus new issue, We really need to, you have to understand, these are words you're not going to hear from me very often, OK? And if you know anyone at Sourcefire or Cisco or Checkpoint, don't ever tell them I said this to you. But you've got to feel a little bit sorry for them at this point, right? Because at the moment, they're, they're catching up. Do you know, they, they have protocols that aren't clearly defined. They have protocols that multitude varies of different ways that we use the protocol the different stacks and how we implement it. And then, let's talk about, we'll just completely fucking ignore the RFC. That's always a lot of fun. So, I'm going to give you two examples of this happening. The first one, I'm going to, who, everyone raise your hands again. The Austrians taught me this because no one ever puts their hands up. Come on, I'm going to name and shame people who don't put their hands up. Come on. You, you definitely, I can see you. Right. How many of you have heard of Fitbit? Keep your hands up if you've heard of Fitbit. You as well. Right. How many of you used Fitbit? 
You know I haven't, right? <laughs> right? You can put your hands down. So, Fitbit. How many of you follow someone on Twitter that uses Fitbit, and we get this fucking little tweet? Look, Linux has walked four steps. Easy fat bastard. <laughs> we see this all the time, right? So what Fitbit does, Fitbit, like, you, you go onto your site and you connect it, connect it to the sites. Say, so, okay, you're going to upload my, tweet my shit. And what happens is, is Fitbit goes and does its cloudy fucking social media thing. Woohoo! Unfortunately, the developers at Fitbit do not conform to RFC standards. So, a get so when you're making a request, you have a user agent string. This is quite clearly defined in the protocol. Right? Well, they didn't. So what happened is a lot of organizations with a lot of staff started getting malware alerts. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Send the cyber fire trucks because the cyber Chinese are coming. Whoop, 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 whoop. Malware, malware, malware. Turns out, no, just a lot of Fitbit users. Because the Fitbit users, the, uh, the developers weren't conforming to the standard. They didn't put a user agent string in. You know who else doesn't like to put user agent strings in their software? Malware authors. Surprise, surprise. So there we have a developer completely out of the control of these snake oil vendors, completely out of their control, doing stuff that doesn't conform to the standard. Well, let's not get the violin out for the, the world's smallest violin out for the IDS vendors just yet. So it was discovered. So the protocol for IP is pretty clear. If you have an invalid checksum, you drop the packet. OK? Well, it was discovered by some spurious types that what they could do is they could send a lot of packets. And guess what? Guess where you think the IPS vendors cut a corner? They were not checking the IP checksums. They're on to us, OK? Everyone's getting banned. Run. <laughs> so they weren't, checking, they weren't checking the IP checksum. So what we could do is we could put in spurious. I've not even got my e-cigarette on yet. Fuck's sake. It's a badass coil on that thing. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Your next motherfuckers, I promise you. So. IP checksums, right? We weren't checking it. We can put in extra packets. We can camouflage what's going on, right? Clearly defined in the protocol. Clearly drop the fucking packet. And they didn't. They didn't do it. And they paid the price for that, which is blinding your IDS. You know, this, this billion, well, it's now presumed to be nearly 2.9 billion a year, but blinding your IPS by not following the fucking protocol. We've only just got to network. We're only up one layer here, right? We haven't really done anything that's hacking foo right now. This is just all I want to fuck about with the protocol. If you've got an IPS that you look after, fuzz the shit out of it, right? Just fu fuzz it all day, every day. Just don't do it from your test machine IP, because if it's got active defense, you, you might have to wait a little while. So we have this issue. And as I said earlier on, you've got to love IPS vendors, scaled with a problem of their making, combined a little bit with ours. What they did is go, they didn't stick their hands up and say, we're wrong. No. What they did is they went back to the drawing board and went, huh, protocol normalization. We've got a new product. All of our inline devices. I don't need lights, OK, it's cool. <laughs> Just talk amongst yourself. I've been taught that when that's on, it's my turn. And when that's off, it's your turn. So I'm waiting for it to go off again. So they produce a new product, you know, inline protocol normalization. How many of you have had experience with this? How many of you know what I'm talking about when I talk about protocol normalization? How many of you have seen that scene in Aliens where, where <laughs> Where Ripley says, we need to nuke it from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. That is protocol normalization. OK? And I will explain why. So all of these issues of skipping past the defenses is because we don't know what the endpoint is. 
right? So there's different ways that we can talk to different endpoints. So some smart guy in IPS world went, we should totally be the endpoint, and then we'll analyze it. Because then we know what we're sending out to the endpoint. They kind of nuke it from orbit. Two issues with this. First and foremost, you can only normalize protocols if you're in line, right? Doesn't work if you're a passive member of the network, because you're passive. Not even the most passive aggressive person could do any shit at this point. And secondly, these are fucking people that do not read RFCs, rewriting data streams on your network that are guilty of ignoring a defined, clear standard. We did some research about um, enumerating IPSs. And you don't really enumerate IPSs. What you do is you enumerate the, uh, the signatures. Because who gives a fuck what the IPS actually is? I don't give a fuck. I, I care about how you interpretate threats. I don't care if you're a Cisco, Sourcefire, or a fucking Raspberry Pi. What I care about is the rules that you're doing. So we did some tests about how we can enumerate this shit. And we did this. Protocol normalization is so easy to pick up, it's unbelievable. So engineer solution here. There is a, we call these insertion attacks, where you insert extra packets into the data stream, knowing that the IPS will see uh, one picture and not the other picture. So some spurious types discovered that what they could do is they could produce a data stream with one hop less than destination. So the IPS would see this big, long pile of packets and go, oh, fuck, it's OK. They're just downloading a Windows update. And by the time the packets get there, all the camouflage is dropped because it's one hop short of host. Wow, wah, wah, wah. You know, bingo, got you. So the guys thought, you know what we should totally do? We should totally rewrite time to lives. So people like me are able to put packets into a network. And then with like a time to live of four, and then I'm going to watch it suddenly, ping, become eight. And we go, ah, you're using Sourcefire. <laughs> OK, because these are clearly defined what they do in these situations. We can send packets in an ordered structure and watch Sourcefire reorder them. Ha <laughs> ha and you've got this rule engaged as well. I'm totally going to change my attack now, because I know that you can't do this, but I know you're fucking good at this. So let's leave that, and let's push here. That's what we want to do. But you know what? I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I mean, I'm probably telling you some nice anecdotes that I maybe make you think about when you're testing an IPS. And you might email me some funny stories, as this one was. You know you're a sad detection geek when your friend calls you up in the middle of the day and says, dude, you are never going to fucking believe what I've just heard. What is it? I was in a customer meeting with the senior network administrator, and they've been having some issues with the load on their IPS, OK. So he advised them that they should SSL encrypt all the traffic to take the load off the IPS. OK. <laughs> Let me just clear this up for you, OK? All the traffic is completely blind to the IPS. No more load issues. No more false positives. No more true positives either. I think that we are at a point where we can fit clearly, fairly say that maybe using SSL as a load balancer is not such a bad thing nowadays. You know, maybe it's fit for purpose. But I have to ask, why not think green, motherfucker? Turn the thing off, right? If you're going to do shit like this, just unplug it. You know, while we're at it, right, how many of you are involved in the PCI industry? Because fuck you. I mean, no, no, no disrespect, but the PCI industry requires you to have a third-party application scanner, an IDS, or web app, or whatever you fucking want to call it, right? Third-party application scanner. Not your own, from a third party that scans your application for shit. Detection system, in other words, okay? Also requires you not to break an SSL tunnel. You can break an SSL tunnel under certain requirements, but they're pretty hard and heavy. So long story short, must have a detection system, cannot break the tunnel to look what's inside, the encrypted traffic. Like, hey, 
I'm going to point the obvious out to you, but that fucking sucks because you have encrypted endpoint, encrypted endpoint, encrypted traffic, IPS. We don't get any false positives. We don't have fucking any true positives either. You know, and this, <laughs> this happens to me more, more and more and more than you would like to believe. I constantly, if someone says to you that their IPS doesn't get any false positives, I can assure you that they fucking configured it wrong. Right? If you have an IPS that doesn't have any false positives, it's because someone's unplugged it. Right? So, encrypted tunnel, encrypted tunnel, IPS. Trust me. You have two types of people in the world. We've got binary on this shit right now. One people that know exactly what's going on at this point and are like, huh, at least we're compliant. And another bunch of people that go, I have no idea what this man is saying to me. <laughs> How many do you think I speak to? <laughs> More than you'd like to believe. It gets me so mad to hear this. I want to hit a motherfucker with another motherfucker. That's how mad it makes me. Right? It just, it does. It, 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 fucking how much money are we wasting on this shit? Honestly. So if you're like, if you're the people on the PCA council, right, instead of saying we should have a third party application scanner, you should say that you need to have a registered detection rate, right? Watch the game change overnight. So we've talked about defined protocols. We've talked about people ignoring protocols. We've talked about protocols not being clear. We've talked about fuckery in the middle. We've talked about using protocols to bust other protocols. You know, we've covered a, a little bit of ground really quickly here. Now let's interject something that's a lot of fun. De facto protocols. So even if you can read, there isn't anything to fucking read. De facto protocols. What do I mean by de facto protocols? DCE, RPC. Not defined in RFC. We should call it MSRPC. I believe it was for a while. So we have this situation that happens. God bless Conflict. God bless MSO867. I'm not sure if I miss John McAvee more. MSO867, or LOLSEC, to be honest with you. Uh, but MSO867, we would never be able to do demos at conferences if it wasn't for this protocol. But this protocol led to a little bit of IDS research. Because what we discovered is that, you know when you don't clearly define a protocol, it's kind of hard to write signatures for it? Well, the problem is, in the case of SMB, how many of you use SMB and court planned? Fucking corporations love this shit. Who would have thunk it that corps want to share their documents with each other? <gasps> we use a fucking proprietary protocol for that shit that some, if you want to ask how hard it is to make reverse engineer proprietary protocols in the SMB case, just ask the Samba guys, okay? I know a few of them and they're all slightly weird. I know exactly why. Because there's some hinky shit in there. Oh my god. So these are some evasions that we see in SMB. These are all ones that you can find in Metasploit. I just wanted to pick on stuff that you could get your hands on now. Okay? I am not going to talk about SMB pipe IO read write because I have spent five years talking about this. Fucking Google it. Right? It's a clusterfuck of a situation. Um, I can totally A tell. I can tell from a TCP stream that you're using Metasploit because this thing is turned on by default and there's no way to turn it off. So as soon as I see these hinky packets come along that don't conform to the documentation about how you should set up an SMB communication, you know, the, the only tiny bit of documentation that Microsoft gives us, you go, oh, fucking hell. That's happened when HD discovered a, 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 an IDS evasion technique. And he was like, whoo I rock. I'm going to turn that shit on by default. Get root or die trying. The problem with Matsploit is that they're not so cool at documenting shit. Like, if you want to write a module, do total documentation. But understanding how things work is a little bit different. But this research kind of takes place from uh, a situation we had about four years ago with a vendor that I have totally trolled for a long time, Stonesoft. 
Um, they released like 300 odd idea, uh, advanced evasion techniques, AETs. Ah, oh, AETs, you're all susceptible to it. I'm like, shit, industry shut a brick, right? They went, the f what? what's an advanced evasion technique? Can't tell you, responsible disclosure. And we're like, yeah, yeah, you do know that we'd like to detect, like, we're detection, right? Yeah, 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 there's 300 of them, it's fucking bad. Dude, pfft, over. We can detect them, but shit, you're fucked. Well, give us some information. Responsible disclosure. They fucking reserved CVEs and didn't fucking put anything in them. Gotta love them. Well, it turns out that what an advanced evasion technique is, you take a fucking old evasion technique and a really old evasion technique, you put them together, you call them an advanced evasion technique, and you let your marketing machine go and do the rest of the work. Woohoo! We were the first to discover them. No, you fucking weren't. They were in Metasploit in 2006. You can use more than one evasion technique. Now, the reason that most systems didn't get tested for advanced evasion techniques is quite simple, really. How many of you are web app testers? Because obfuscation of your obfuscation is obscure, right? The more obfuscation you use it tends to look a little bit fucking weird. Who would have thought that coming? You know? So I had the benefit of speaking with one of their researchers a little while ago. <laughs> it was a fun conversation. Um, the immortal lines he said to me were, you're a victim of our marketing machine. And I thought, I don't feel like a victim right now. <laughs> you look like you're sweating the fuck ton, though. And what it is, is I said to him, I know quite clearly that you haven't read the Achilles heel of detection systems. So how do you know that? Because it clearly states that for every evasion technique that you use, when you start adding them on, your detection surface increases by sixfold. So, what happened is, you see this DCE RPC fragmentation stuff? Snort was really fucking shit at picking it up. Because this DCE RPC preprocessor was sucks. Not anymore. But they use like TCP segmentation, which Snort are really fucking good at. So, all of a sudden, you see where I'm going with this? If they'd have just left the attack with the DCE RPC fragmentation, it wouldn't have been detected. But they put the TCP segmentation in, and guess what? They detected it. The surface gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the more shit that you add to it. Six times, apparently. And they were like, really? Yeah. Do you want me to send a PDF? Oh, yes, please. Then they released them free after that, so. But yeah, obfuscation is obscure, right? You do lots of obfuscation. Like those who are doing web app testing, right? If you do like more than two obfuscations to it, either your attack is not working or some fucking alarm's going off somewhere. And if they don't, man, just cash that check and you're winning. <laughs> so, good old Stonesoft. I need to stop picking on them because they've got a better class of lawyers now. Um, Stonesoft get purchased by McAvey for 200 million euros. There was a lot of us at the time that went, what? Yes, Intel purchased, well, McAvey purchases Intel, uh, um, Stonesoft. 200 million euros. Like, why the fuck, what? Why would you do that? You've got, you've, you've got metal. You don't need to buy any more metal, you've got it. Distribution network, apparently. But, what you realize is even John McAvee's not that fucking insane. Don't shoot me, bro. Right? But even he wouldn't do this crazy stuff. And now I get, I get asked reports about, about it. And uh, every now and again, I have to give my opinion on stuff. And the best one is, what do you think about the, the McAvee purchase of Stonesoft? And I'm like, I have no fucking idea. But what I can tell you is they've purchased a detection system company as the detection system company that's just been purchased by a processor company. Um, there's going to be pushing in the middle, and yeah, that's going to be fun because there's lots of changes going on. And meanwhile, John McAfee gets his name back, so amen to John. And then, of course, we have this interesting in issue of source fire. So, hey, 200 million euros, woo, not a bad payday. You know, not as good as $2.7 billion, though, is it? And that's what source fire get paid for. Hang on a second, Aunt Cisco. 
an IPS vendor too. Hang on, why are we seeing IPS vendors buying little ones? And believe it or not, Sourcefire were a little company, to be honest with you. They get paid though. Whoa, these people get paid. 11 years before, Checkpoint tried to buy um, Sourcefire. $225 million. That was an inflation of the price. Do you know how you increase your net worth by 11,000% in seven years? You become an IDS vendor. Because Cisco go and buy them for an overpriced stock market value of 2.7 billion cash. Boom. Take that to the bank. Woo. People ask me, what do we think is going to happen with Sourcefire? Or, or more to the point, what's going to happen with Snort? So, Phoenix gets his crystal ball out, okay? I get a rag on my head and some earrings in, and I'll try and be septic finning and kind of see the future. And what I see is, uh, I don't, anyone that's ever dealt with Cisco, Cisco is like a fucking oil tanker, right? They, they don't turn quickly. Like, everything is slow. Like, Cisco didn't re realize the NSA had fucking been doing shit to them until they saw their pictures and fucking, like, on the internet. Like, shit, that's our shit. <laughs> Fucking hell, DHL. They didn't know. I don't care what you say. Like, they're too big to know what was going on. But what I think is going to happen with Sourcefire, or Snort more to the point, is that Snort is not going to be closed down by Cisco. But we're probably going to see a situation where it gets put out to the community, much like Oracle did with open office, blah, 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 blah. Okay. What do we worry about rules? Well, what we'll see in rules, we're probably going to see Cisco stop doing rules for Snort but we're going to see lots of ancillary businesses pop up that will write specific rule sets, like emerging threats and so on and so forth. So we want you to do some SCADA shit for us. Here's X amount. We want a monthly subscription for SCADA rules. Dun, 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 dun. We're probably going to see an increase in that shit. I'm going to talk about one more story quickly. So a lot of what we do about detection systems is based on a paper in the late 70s called the Common Intrusion Detection Framework. And it has this really cool rule in it that makes a lot of sense. Once you detect something, you should always fucking detect it, right? If you detect it once, you should detect it a million times, right? Not a lot to ask for, is it? Right? So, welcome to IPS Vendor Club, the cartel, right? Throughput, 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 throughput. I pretty much just saved you the time of listening to any IDS vendor pitch, right? No one talks about detection rates. Full first rule of IPS club is don't talk about detection rates. Second rule of IPS club is shh, don't talk about detection rates. So <laughs> throughput, throughput, throughput. So there is a vendor who thinks it's a really good idea to buffer, have a system that buffers a thousand popular threats. Right? Fucking fantastic throughput. Thousand popular threats. So what do you think happens when a new popular threat comes onto the market? See the one on the end? Gone. So what you were detected, <laughs> let, let me get this right, so you, what you were detected six months ago does not necessarily mean you're gonna be picking up anymore. You know the evasion technique here? Use some old shit. Like, you're gonna find old boxes knocking about. This vendor can't pick up shit. PCI compliant, no? I mean, really? It's of all aboard the fail cup. The, trust me, if you want to hear some horror stories, I've got them coming out of my ass. Right? But all aboard the fucking fail copter on this one. Kill chain. Oh my god. So, I'm going to wrap up really quickly with this one, but the kill chain's fucking awesome. So, how many of you know what the kill chain is? Right? Oh man, you guys have got so much fun to come because you can get this shit shoved down your throat. This is like next gen 2.0 of our industry, right? The cyber kill chain trademark. I was very disappointed to find out the cyber kill chain did not kill all the cybers. But Lockheed Martin does some work with the military. Who would have seen that coming? And the military have this thing called a kill chain. Because you've got to love the military. They're fucking ruthless at killing other people or illegal insurgents or whatever you want to call them. 
And uh, what they discovered is it's not just a case of shooting someone. You need to get intel. You need to put boots on the ground. You need to get them there. You need to buy them guns. You need to give them bullets. You need fucking intel, right? And all along the way, these steps. And if you don't safeguard these steps, you don't get to kill the bad guy or the illegal insurgent or whatever we're calling them today, right? You don't get to do it because the bad guy will disrupt it. What they also sorted out was, wow, this kill chain shit, that's really good for defense because the bad guy needs to get guns, needs to get bullets, needs to get intel, needs to get bodies, needs someone to pull the trigger and shoot them. If we break all of these things, it's very, very hard for bad guys to kill us, right? Lockheed Martin come along and went, woohoo, trademark, and we'll stick a cyber in front of it, and happy days, payday. Right? And that's exactly what happened. Because it turns out in attacks, exactly the same thing happens. That you need to be profiled. You need to get intel. You need to get exploits. You need, you know, you need command and control. All of these points are very, very good places to, to, to detect or indicate that some threat is coming. So rather than us use this to kind of empower and make the world a little bit better, we trademarked it, and now, like, I probably owe a royalty for speaking about it or something, but that's what we're at. And the problem is, in the end, the real problem that IDS will always have, because you're going to get context to where it's shoved down your throat, is we need context, context, context. The problem is, is we don't need more data, right? This is a real issue. We really don't need more data. And why don't we need more data? Because we're going to need a fucking bigger boat if we carry on, right? That in the end, all the stuff that we need to know to be able to talk about threats, we actually already log in half, you know? We just don't do our log reviews or don't keep the data long enough to do it, okay? So we don't need any of that. So wrapping up, I wanted to put this slide in, so I'm going to segue this in, but 2014 has been a fucking good year for us. Right? I mean, if you're not getting paid this year, right, your business model sucks. Because there's been enough marketing for us out there that we should be doing things better. Um, you've got to love our industry. We fail, we get paid. I think you pretty much said that yesterday. Like, we don't get paid for... We, get, we don't get paid for winning, we get paid for losing. We're in the fucking right game, man. You should all give yourself a round of applause and a pat on the back that we managed to get there. IDS vendors. They're a bit like this dog. I will protect you from all the known APTs and zero days. And then the Hoover goes and they go, Whoa! That's exactly IDS vendors right there, okay? So, do you guys have any questions for me? I know that I'm running short on time. I'm probably chewing into Kennedy's talk and I don't want to do that shit because I hope he's talking about SCT or something, man. <laughs> right, is there any questions? No question, so thank hang you on, very hang much. On, hang on, <laughs> Sorry. Just one more thing, the Colombo moment. <laughs> Feedback forms. If you haven't noticed the subliminal fucking messages through this talk, fill your feedback forms in and win shit, okay? Give everyone and all the volunteers and everything, give them a clap as well.